Father, we thank you for the day, and just um, just as we continue to work our way through the Old Testament and dealing with some of the law codes and, and things that at, at first may seem irrelevant that we can take and apply some of these into our own lives and, and see some of the significances behind uh, some of the things that you put forth in the Old Testament as well. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so last week we ended with the crossing of the Red Sea and Moses and the Israelites out in the wilderness. Eventually they make it to Mount Sinai. This is what Mount Sinai looks like. It's not a big mountain. I mean, you know, it's not like uh, Mount Everest or something like that where it's this, uh, you know, the biggest mountain. But out in the middle of the desert, I've seen overhead shots of it out in the middle of the desert. It doesn't, it's significant. So... When they go up and Moses goes up on top of the mountain and and he's gone for a number of days and they're going, hey, where's Moses at? We haven't seen him for a while. You know, it's not like he's going up a, a hill or something like that. He is up on top of a fairly tall mountain and, and these kind of things. So they camp out at Mount Sinai for about nine months or so. That's what they can guess. Uh, so they're a significant amount of time. This is where they get the Ten Commandments. And you can break the Ten Commandments down into kind of uh, two different areas or focuses, emphases, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the first are the duties for God. You have the uh, no other gods. That one too, see, that one for us is kind of easy. We're like, oh yeah, no other gods. We're Christians. We understand that. Remember, there. This is the ancient world where every other culture outside of Israel were polytheists. Islam had, wasn't even around at this point. So, you literally, Israel was the only religion that had only one god. So that's a big thing for them, and that's why you see them struggle with this throughout the whole rest of the Old Testament. And the judges, and in all these things, Samuel or uh, Solomon marries all those wives and has all kinds of problems with all these other gods and, and that kind of stuff because it's so different compared to everything else in the culture. Uh, so that's one of their, their big things. Idolatry, no graven images. This is another big issue. Every other culture in the ancient world, they would make these little statues. I should have brought some pictures. Maybe next week I'll remind myself to go over to Dr. Price, Dr. Price down at the Biblical Museum in, Li in Liberty. has hundreds of these little statue things. And some of them are kind of creepy looking <laughs> and they look kind of weird. But uh, they would make these little statues and then they would pray to them or they would have them in yeah. the temple. And they were not, they didn't believe that the God necessarily was the statue, but the God represented the statue was represented by the statue. So they would go and pray to it, and they would go and put food in front of these statues and, and think that the gods were going to eat them, and they were providing for the gods, and they were trying to win the gods' favor by doing these things. So God, Israel is the only one in the ancient world that doesn't have a statue. When you, when we, we'll see when they get to the tabernacle and the temple, there's no statue inside it. There's the, the Ark of the Covenants there with the Ten Commandments and some other things. Well, there's no statues. They have to take the name of the Lord in vain. The Sabbath is created in order to keep them from resting, or to keep them resting and focused on God one day of the week. They work, we think we work a lot. They work in the ancient world. You work six days of the week. You had one day off instead of two days off. Uh, but most other cultures, they didn't have any days off. They just worked all the time because they think you're a farmer. You're in an agrarian society. You can't take a lot of days off because you don't plant the food and go out and harvest the food. You don't have any food to, to live off of. So uh, God establishes all these things in order for kind of to give them a prototype of how to live. And then they have the duties to man. One that comes up very frequently that... You know, if you're a parent, you really like it, but if you're not a parent, you may not as much. If you're a kid, is the honoring the parents. And sometimes we think, oh, yeah, that's just a, a minor sin, but you find this one on, in several occurrences in the New Testament. Uh, 
Paul and, and others will, will make a list of sins, you know, adultery and murder and all this stuff, and then he'll throw in disobedience to parents. And you're like, it just kind of seems weird. You're like, oh, that, that, why is that one in there? Because it was, it's, it's a very serious offense to God that you're being dishonoring your parents. Remember, these are in the Middle East. They're not that we are not as reverential to parents in, in America. Well, probably we are. But in the Middle East, you are you don't say anything to your parents. You you have to honor them. If you don't, they'll kill you or they'll you know disown you and this kind of stuff. So they take this very, very seriously. The not kill one always gets a question mark. It really means not murder. Sometimes people go overboard with the pacifism and say, oh yeah, I can't kill anybody because of that. But we'll see. Joshua is a military leader. Moses even leads the army at, at different points. David is a warrior. If, if you couldn't kill in battle, then when David killed Goliath, it wouldn't have been celebrated. It would have been like, hey, he broke the law. But so you can fight and defend your country in a battle in certain situations. But we would call that kind of now shall not murder. Adultery, stealing, some of these are pretty obviously. False witness, lying, not coveting is against materialism, which usually if you're coveting something, it leads to one of those other ones. If you want something really bad, a lot of times people will murder to steal from you or they'll lie about it to do something. So that one kind of leads to a lot of other ones. So uh, the Ten Commandments really can be summed up as kind of God's ideal law code or situation or how, how God wants the world to act, which is why in the New Testament, a lot of these are kind of restated and even emphasized even greatly. Like, for example, in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you know, hey, in the, in the law it says, don't commit adultery, I say don't even look after a woman. In the law it says don't kill a guy, I say don't even get angry at people. So there's, they kind of keep a lot of these commandments in, in what we would call the law of Christ. Sometimes it's referred to as that in the New Testament. Uh, and some of them are brought back over into this. So traditionally Christians have always assumed that the Ten Commandments were important and kind of give us an idea of how God would have want us to live as believers. Exodus chapter, it's in Exodus chapter 20. I should have wrote that on the slide as well. Uh, sometimes people always want to see, why are they taking down the Ten Commandments in the schools and then in the courthouses and stuff? And then you ask somebody, well, what are the Ten Commandments? And they'd be like, well, I don't really know. I don't, I don't even know where they're found. But they seem really important, so we shouldn't take those down. So you might want to familiarize yourself with them and, and that kind of thing. They build the, then after that one, they build the tabernacle. The tabernacle is essentially the prototype for the temple. Remember, they're, they're going to walk through the wilderness for the next 40 years. Then they're going to conquer the land that's going to take a number of years. Then they're going to have the whole period of the judges. The temple will not be built for, if this is 1400, the temple is built in like 930 B.C., so the temple is still about 500 years away at this point. So that God tells them, I want you to build the tabernacle. And this is kind of what, well, let me show you what it looks like. This is kind of what it would look like. It's essentially, they have a wall around it, and it's just a big tent, because they're going to pack this up and carry it with them around the wilderness. So you don't have a, it's not really a building per se. There's only one gate that leads into it for security purposes and symbol, symbolic purposes that you can only go through this at certain times. Here's a better picture of what it looks like. They've actually recreated this in Israel, which is where these pictures are from. They have, and I think they also have one down in like uh, Orlando in the Holy Land adventure thing or next to Disney, they've recreated these kind of things. And so they've got kind of a wall around it. They have the, bro the bronze altar where they would make the sacrifices. 
They had this is called the labor where they would do the ceremonial washings. You'd have to wash yourself seven times to be clean. And then inside the tent, you have four items in the tent. You have the golden lampstand, which is we call this a menorah now. Uh, if you're familiar with Hanukkah, they light the menorah seven times. They had one of these in there for lighting purposes. The Ark of the Covenant is in there. That's where they would keep the Ten Commandments. The, the I say the original. Well, Moses destroys the original with the golden calf, but the sec the, the replicas that he goes and makes again, essentially, they keep those in there. They, uh, they keep Aaron's staff in there. They keep some manna in there. They, there's a couple different things they keep in there. Then there's another altar in there for uh, where God's, they call it the, the mercy seat. It's behind the, the curtain, so to speak. And then you have the showbread table where the priest would go in and have uh, the meal on the Day of Atonement. We'll get to that in a second here, but... Uh, let me go back here. The significance of it is they're going to have to communicate with God in some manner in the Old Testament. So they have the God establishes the priesthood. He establishes certain things that they're only allowed to do. The average person could not go to the the, the tabernacle. You had to be a priest to go to the taber to get into the tabernacle, and then inside of that tent. Only the pre, the high priest could go in and only once a year on the Day of Atonement. So it wasn't even like it was something that was that you were going into. They could go into, say if you cut it in half here, they could go into the first half, but where the Ark of the Covenant is and everything, they called that the Holy of Holies. And that's where the, the mercy seat was. It was kind of like God's house, so to speak. And and in the Israel, remember they don't have churches or buildings or this kind of stuff. This is where God rested, and the Shekinah glory of God would kind of sit in there. Not doesn't mean that God's not omnipresent; He's not everywhere. But it was a mod thing that God created to kind of show them that how that He was with them out in the wilderness. So when we get to Leviticus. God is going to describe. Kind of how is this all going to work? How is, remember, they're, they're kind of out on their own. They've been a slave for 400 years. If you've been in slavery for 400 years and you all of a sudden have your freedom, you're probably like, how do we establish a government? How do we like just have ordinary laws and day-to-day and -day operations? You know, they, they've been told what to do for 400 years. If you didn't have all that, you'd be like, you know, it's kind of like when... Uh, when they win the American Revolution, they got to sit down and they got to go, okay, it's nice that we got the British gone, but now how do we run our own government? And they got, the, you know, they write the Articles of Confederation and then those don't work and then they got to redo it and write the Constitution. So it becomes kind of a process, but God uh, establishes this for them. So Moses is the author again. Written at, for, in, written at Mount Sinai. Moses is going to write this while they're there. That's why it takes so long. It takes them about nine months to write all these things down and kind of get this established while they're out there. So I'm not going to I'm not going to go through all of the whole book of Leviticus because I want you guys to come back next week and you guys probably look if I did that. But I'm going to give some highlights and then I'm also going to talk about kind of. Uh, at the end, how did the Old Testament law compare to some of the other law codes and, and things of the ancient Near East? Uh, so first, you have some different types of offerings. Sometimes we think there's only, oh yeah, they made offerings in the Old Testament, but there's different types of offerings for different situations, if you will. So you didn't just always make the same offering. You would make an offering based on what did you do and, and these kind of things. So first you have an offering, a voluntary offering, if you made an offense uh, towards God. So this would be like if you blaspheme God or you uh, worshipped an altar. If you broke one of the first four commandments, kind of that idea, that you would go and have to make a sacrifice 
to do these things. And there's different types of sacrifices. The burnt, you know, the burnt offering, which is the lamb. You have a meal offering, which is kind of like a grain offering, like a, a corn or whatever grain. I'm not sure what kind of grains there are. And I'm not a farmer, but corn and grains and, and these kind of things. You have a peace offering, which is really in a sense that you are making peace with God. It's almost like, all right, God, let's kind of get back on. I made a mistake. Let's kind of get back on. Think of it if you're a kid and you get in trouble, the next day you might kind of uh, make mom and dad breakfast in bed or something like that to kind of butter them up a little bit. That's kind of, in a sense, what a peace offering is a little bit. It's kind of like, God, oh, I know I made a mistake, so let me kind of go the extra mile to give you this kind of offering uh, as well. Then you have what they call compulsory offerings. These are, if you made, if you went and made a sin against somebody, you had to do these offerings. So you have a sin offering. This would be if you purposely did a some type of harmful thing. You lied to somebody, you stole from somebody, you did something that is clearly understandable in your in your that you did something wrong. So they would do a sin offering. A trespass offering is kind of like if you accidentally made a mistake and you didn't maybe you didn't even realize it. Say you are driving in your chariot and you ran over your neighbor's bushes or something like that. And they come over to you and they say, Hey, you ran over our bushes. Okay, well let me go make an offering to kind to kind of restore our relationship but also restore our relationship to God. If you were uh, driving in your tractor and you had what we would consider like manslaughter. You know, you accidentally ran over somebody, but you didn't mean it and in a harmful way, or you did you weren't out trying to murder somebody, or you know, you if something like that happened, you would go and make a trespass offering to do this. So many the different all types of offerings that are given. Then you have this consecration of the priesthood. Uh, the priests are only from the tribe of Levi. You can only, if you were, so if you were from a different tribe and you wanted to be a priest, you were just kind of out of luck. You had to be from the tribe of Levi, but you, all the Levites weren't priests. There's, that's why in the story of the Good Samaritan, it says, oh, there was a priest that came by, and then there was a Levite that came by. They're not the same thing. They're both from the tribe of Levi, but a priest was kind of like a pastor uh, in their culture, a Levite is kind of like a, somebody that kind of helps at the church. Maybe he's the church custodian or the secretary or, or somebody who's not necessarily a pastor, but he serves at the temple and, and helps in, in these different kinds of ways. They have, they have to go through this kind of uh, purification ritual. Sounds kind of weird to us because... You know, when we generally come to church, we kind of hope that you've taken a bath and you don't stink and you don't have all these problems. But in their culture, it's kind of the idea that when you come to God, you need to be clean. So they would have these things called mikvahs. And this picture, it's not a great picture. Think of it like a baptistry. And this is, they have them all over Israel. They found a bunch of these. It's kind of like a giant bathtub. And they would walk in before they would go to the temple and they would dunk themselves seven times in the mikvah to be spiritually clean. So that, that always that people always ask in the, at Pentecost, when all these people get saved, where did they go to get baptized? They probably went to all these mikvahs that are all around town, and the, the apostles probably gave them this because there's no river in Jerusalem. So you wouldn't have went and they wouldn't have went, you know, 50 miles down the road to to go. Uh, get baptized there, they probably took him to these things that were already established. They would, sometimes they would be anointed with oil. Uh, you'll see that. They end up eventually doing that with the king. Samuel anoints David with oil. They do, sometimes they would do this for the high priest. And then we'll see here on the Day of Atonement, blood becomes a, a kind of an issue. Then we have the sanctification. They have all these food laws in the Old Testament, being kosher. We kind of are familiar with that a little bit. And people always ask, why do they have food law? 
And there's a couple of different options here. I'm not, I don't have all the answers, but I have a couple of options for you. One is some of the food laws are established because God had known. For example, one of the food laws says you can't mix milk, milk, dairy products, and meat. You might say, well, what? So you can have a burger or you could have cheese, but you can't have a cheeseburger. And you go, well, what is up with that? What, did God just not like McDonald's or something? No. And the ancient, God knows, and his, uh, you know, they don't know about heart attacks in the ancient world. God knows, hey, if you eat a cheeseburger every day, you're going to get clogged up and you're going to probably die at about 30 or something like that because you can have a heart attack. So God is kind of giving them some knowledge. Pork, they, they can't have bacon. They can't have pork. Why? Because in the ancient world, they didn't prepare it right, and a lot of people died from worms and intestinal problems and these kind of things because they didn't know how to prepare these things like we do now. So that's, uh, they're not allowed to have shellfish, so they couldn't have shrimp. Why? Because there's a lot of people that have terrible shellfish allergies that they'll literally drop dead if they have, uh, if they're in the presence of shellfish. So it could be that God is kind of just saying, just stay away from these things. You don't know, maybe not know why of the reason behind this, but just stay away from that. But it also, that may be part of it, but it also might be God wants them to kind of look unique in their culture. Why? Because all of a sudden everyone's going to go, why are those Jewish people so different than everybody else? Oh, then it's, oh, because their God is different. And they look, so it may be that kind of God is establishing these laws and principles to kind of give them kind of a, a, a way to stand out in their culture. Remember, they're not a world power. They're not Egypt or Assyria or Persia. They're not conquering the world. So you got to have some way for the world to be attracted to them. So one of the ways God may have done it is through these different types of food laws and clothing. They have all these clothing laws and, and all these different things that were established in the Old Testament. Then, point two here, you have what's called the Day of Atonement. This is established in chapter 15. And I need two volunteers, so I'm going to pick you. Yeah, I'm going to pick you to come up here. I'm going to have to kill one of you, so I have to decide. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Your mother or your wife. <laughs> so, this is how the Day of Atonement works. Every Once a year, they call it the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. <laughs> they would get two goats. Oh. <laughs> I'm, trouble, right? yeah, right. I'm not a goat. Well, well you can make it goat, right? <laughs> They would get two goats, and the high priest, he'd get all dressed up for this in his garments. We'll see a picture of that here soon. And uh, the priest would come out, and he would kill one of the goats. So you're dead. They kill the goat, <laughs> and they take the blood of the goat, and they would put it on... The, what they would call the scapegoat, which is where we get the term the scapegoat from. And then they would symbolically pray over the scapegoat, and it was like the sins of the people for that year were being symbolically placed on the scapegoat. So you're full of sin, technically, in this picture. And then they would drive the scapegoat out of the out to the wilderness, and it would leave. So you have to leave right now, yeah. uh, temporarily. And it's this kind of symbol um, they're driving sin away from the camp and that the the, the, the the sacrificial goat has to die for the scapegoat to then be saved and be able to leave and the sin be driven away from the camp. Is there all kind of pictures of what Jesus will eventually become one day? He becomes the sacrificial goat so or lamb, however you want to describe it, so that in the, in the day of atonement, it was a goat, but he becomes the lamb eventually in the New Testament and dies for us so that we can be the scapegoat and be spared the judgment that we would rightfully do. So these are all pictures that God establishes in the Old Testament so that when you get to the New Testament, they're not just like, well, this is weird. We never heard of this. No, they, they start piecing these things together. The apostles start piecing all these pictures that show up all throughout the Old Testament and go, ah, oh, now we kind of start connecting the dots and see why God has done these things 
uh, in our own culture. Then you have the, what's called the year of Jubilee. This one was essentially how this works is a, it's a, a seven year period. Every seven years, and I probably should have written this on the slide, but every seven years, what would happen is you would have what's called the year of Jubilee. And in this, they would cancel all your debts, which would be really nice, I'm sure, for a lot of us. We should get, we should develop this. Yeah. <laughs> they would cancel all your debt. They would release all the slaves. So in the ancient, in the Israelites, you had, they had slavery, but think of it more as indentured servitude. You would sell yourself to somebody and kind of work for them for a maximum of six years, because on the seventh year, you were supposed to be let free. Uh, and they would do this. Now, one of the, the big problem is there are not a lot of examples in the Old Testament of them actually following following this. That, so God can establish a law, but if the people don't follow it, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that they're doing a great thing. But then on the 50th year, they would have a big celebration. So every seven, seven is kind of the perfect number in the Bible. So every... Seventh seven, you have 49 years, I think. Um, my math is right on that. Uh, the 50th year after that seven sevens, the 50th year would be the year of Jubilee. And they would have a big celebration every 50th year. And it's kind of a celebration of God is restoring us and helping us and, and doing this. And it's kind of like a big party, so to speak, for that year. It'd be like your 50th birthday party or something like that, that they would do this. So that was what they would call the year of Jubilee. Then there's all these feasts. And we don't really have, think of this as the Jewish holiday system. They don't have President's Day and uh, Mark Valentine's Day and Thanksgiving and Martin Luther King Day and all these kind of stuff. They have other holidays. So the first one they have is Passover. We talked about that last time where the, the God delivered them out of Egypt. The death, land, the death angel passed over their houses because they put the blood on the doorposts. And they celebrate this every year, even to this day, they celebrate this uh, Passover. And it was a celebration of God's deliverance. They celebrate all these still, actually. But I don't know why I said that. But then they had the Feast of First Fruits. They, this was at, during the time of the harvest season. Remember, they're an agrarian society for the most part. So they would have this feast and it's kind of celebrating, hey, the first crop has came in. Let's celebrate what God has done for us this year. So it's kind of like their version of Thanksgiving in a sense, if you, if you want to think of it like that. That they are having, thanking God for giving us uh, these crops and, and giving us a benefit of this. Pentecost, familiar with us uh, because of what happens in the book of Acts on Pentecost, but Pentecost is the end of the grain season. It's 50 days after Passover, and it's essentially celebrating kind of the end of the year, so to speak. They do it. If you're a farmer, you understand that you don't necessarily follow the calendar as much as you follow the, the farming calendar, if you will. You plant in the fall, and you, or you plant in the spring, and you harvest in the fall, and then you take a little vacation, and the next time, and you get back, and you go and do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And you're always doing that because you're farming. So Pentecost is, an, is a kind of a celebration of, think of it like a, a fall festival or something like that that, uh, that we have. Uh, where it's kind of celebrating the end of the harvest season, that they would have these things. Trumpets, it's the new year for them, similar to what we have. The Day of Atonement, we just talked about that. That is the nationwide sacrifice where the, holy, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would kill the goat, sacrifice the goat, put the blood on the scapegoat, let him drive him out of the camp. What's interesting on the Day of Atonement, and this is not in the 
Old Testament, but Jew, there's a, a guy who was, I forget his name now, I'm maybe reminded, remembering about, probably at 7.05, once you guys <laughs> leave, it'll come to me. But uh, he's a Messianic oh, Jew yeah. that was about 100 years ago, and he was a, a priest before this, so he had learned all of the tradition of the Jews. So he kind of knew everything on their side, then he became a Christian and kind of wrote some books to kind of explain some of this, uh, some of their traditions and stuff so that we would understand them from a Christian perspective. And he wrote that on the, the tradition tells us on the Day of Atonement, what would happen is the scape, eventually in the wilderness, if you kick out the scapegoat, he would just go off in the wilderness and they never see him again because you're, you're going to move you're walking through the wilderness, that was fine. When they got and started building cities, eventually the scapegoat started kind of meandering back into town and started eating stuff, and they go, well, that kind of defeats the purpose of the scapegoat. He's supposed to leave. We don't, we don't want to see the scapegoat again, and now he's back into town. So they came up with this idea of saying, well, let's just drive the scapegoat over a cliff, and then we'll never see him again. I know it kind of defeats the symbolism if you kill the scapegoat too, but I didn't come up with this. So they would drive the scapegoat over a cliff, and then every mile or, I don't, I don't know exactly sure how long it was, how long a yell goes for, or you can hear it. I guess it depends on where you're at. But there would be a line of priests every about a mile or so, and they would yell, it is finished, the Day of Atonement. It is finished, it is finished, it is finished, until it finally got back to Jerusalem. So when Jesus is on the cross, the day of the last day of atonement, so to speak, and says, it is finished, he's not saying, like, I'm finished, I'm dead, and, and sometimes we think of it like that. He's saying the day of atonement's finished, the sacrifice is finished. There's no more sacrifices needed because I'm the last sacrifice. I'm dying for you guys. So that's just kind of an interesting insight from some of the Jewish tradition that we kind of can take from this. And then last, there's then this Feast of Tabernacles, which is their gods, they're kind of reminding themselves as a nation, hey, we used to live out in the wilderness for 40 years. And so they'll kind of live in a tent for a night. It's kind of like a giant tent sleepover thing. Uh, and I, I've never seen this, but I've been told this from reliable sources, that in New York City, because there's so many Jewish people there, that if they live in an apartment, sometimes they will have like a little tent out on like their fire escape or something like that. And they will sleep out up outside at night. So one day, maybe I'll go to New York during the Feast of Tabernacles and see if that's actually true or not. But supposedly that's what they do. And in Israel, they will kind of set up their tents and it's kind of a reminder to them, hey, God protected us in the wilderness. Let's not forget about this. So you see, a lot of these feasts are kind of the remembrance idea kind of their version of memorial day let's remember what god has done for us as a nation then they add, this, these are the feasts that are, god establishes in leviticus they add two more feasts later the feast of Purim is added at the time of esther we'll get to esther eventually but esther if you remember the story she is uh, the wife to the king of Persia, and she delivers Israel. The Jews are about to be exterminated. Think of like Hitler kind of extermination. They're going to wipe them out. And she prays to God, and God uses her, and he spares them, and they establish this feast of Purim to remember, oh yeah, that's when Esther saved us from extermination. And so they add this. Then finally, the last one is Hanukkah. This is added... Uh, not during the Old Testament. This is added about 150 B.C., so about 150 years before Jesus. Uh, Jesus celebrates Hanukkah. They call it the Feast of Lights in the New Testament. So Jesus goes up to the Feast of Lights. Uh, the Maccabees were a group that uh, the Jews were under the control of the Greeks. Think Alexander the Great. He conquers everyone. He takes over. And so the Jews are under his occupation and for about a hundred years, they revolt and take charge back over Israel. Now, eventually, they get conquered by the Romans, which is how, when you get to the New Testament, the Romans are in charge. But they 
are able to kind of have an independence for a time, and so they create the Feast of Hanukkah. So that's where that comes from. And it happened on December 25th in like 130 BC or something like that. So it happened, that's where they kind of get the idea of Hanukkah. That's why it always occurs right around our Christmas time. Priesthood, you kind of have this uh, back and forth with the priesthood on the Old Testament. You have the earthly tabernacle that's kind of a representative. The, the, the book of Hebrews says a lot of the, the priestly functions are shadows of something in heaven or shadows of a future time. And so some of the priestly things that kind of represent what, will, what God has already in heaven. So the earthly temple represents the heavenly temple. The once a year sacrifice is then kind of fixed when Jesus comes and he gives a sacrifice once for all. They don't have, you don't have to make a sacrifice anymore. They couldn't go behind, beyond the temple veil, but once a year and only the high priest could do that. Jesus, when he dies, if you remember in the New Testament, the temple veil rips in two. And it's kind of God saying, all right, you no longer have to go through this temple veil. You can come to me with direct access now. You have the, uh, the priest has to make a sacrifice for his own sin before he can go and do the sacrifice for the temple. Jesus doesn't have to do that because he doesn't have any sin. He can just go and die for us without having to uh, make a sacrifice. And then you have the, they talk about the blood of bulls and goats. Isaiah talks about that and the book of Hebrews and some of the Jesus doesn't have to go and slay an animal. He goes and dies it for himself, his own blood, which is where we get the idea of communion, where he, you know, he tells them, I'm going to go and slay my own body, my own blood. There's no more animal sacrifices anymore. I'm going to take care of this. So kind of some ideas of how this goes back and forth. Now we're going to get into a couple of, of things. Sometimes people ask the question, is the Old Testament law bad? One of the things that atheists like to do now is they like to kind of pick and choose things out of the Old Testament and they go, oh, well, look how they treated women back in the day or look how they, they had slavery back in the day or they did this and that. And they're comparing it to our culture today and saying like, oh, they were so evil back then. But I wanted to show some different ways that the Old Testament law, if you look at it actually in its context, you know, a law code that was established 3,000 years ago, it's much better than anything that during its time. It's like the greatest law code of the ancient Near East. One thing it does is it establishes the value of, of life. The Old Testament law that does have the death penalty established because it's the death penalty was established by God, Genesis chapter 9. But the death penalty was only allowed through the state. So the government was the only people allowed to do it, kind of like what we would do. Like, you know, you're not allowed to go out and if somebody murders your brother, you can't go out and murder them back. And, you know, you have, they have to get arrested, and they have to get tried, and then the state, in theory, gives them the death penalty, and although that usually takes, like, 25 years or something like that, it seems like, every time, but they established the death penalty, and you only could do it if you had multiple eyewitnesses. Why is that important? They don't have, like, DNA testing and all this kind of stuff that we have today. They only give you the death penalty if they know for sure that you did this with multiple eyewitnesses. So, in contrast, there's a lot of other A and E. I kept writing that because I didn't want. I felt like didn't want to type out ancient Near East. So think of all their neighbors when you do that. It gets tiring typing ancient Near East all the time. But uh, that's what the technical term is. They allow for what they call revenge killings. Revenge killing is. Oh, you killed my brother. Instead of me waiting for the, the government to arrest you, or however that would work, I go and kill you, or I go and kill your brother to, make, to kind of get even and even the score. That's kind of how justice was served in the ancient world. It was basically, 
you hurt me, I hurt you back in the same manner. The Old Testament law doesn't really allow for that in terms of the death penalty because God is trying to establish, hey, you, know, you don't just go out and murder people and kill people and, and have a great time doing this. But it also establishes that you can't, well, what would happen is, and it kind of sounds like our political system today a little bit, if you were rich and you wanted to, and you killed somebody, and they would go, okay, yeah, you killed somebody, you, you get the death penalty. And you go, well, how, how big of a check do I have to write before you, I don't get the death penalty anymore? And they go, well, you need, you know, a million dollars or whatever the equivalent is. Okay, you don't get the death penalty anymore. You paid your fine and you're good. So that's how it worked in the ancient world predominantly, that you could kind of pay your way out of the death penalty. Well, God's like, no, that's not a good idea because then you get rich people would be killing people all the time. <laughs> And kind of paying out, paying bribes and doing this kind of stuff. So the Old Testament law did not allow for that. Now that doesn't mean that it didn't happen in Israel. And if you read the prophets, and we'll get to them eventually, that's one of the problems is they kind of allow that to happen. And God keeps telling them, hey, you got to fix your justice system. It's not working. And and warns them about this. But they they do that. So another thing is, the Old Testament law viewed life in the womb as equal to life outside the womb. How do we know this? Because I should have wrote all these verses down. I have them all if you need them afterwards. But uh, in the Old Testament law, if you beat a woman, if you punched a woman or hit a woman or something, a pregnant woman, and the baby died and she didn't die, it was still a capital offense because you killed an unborn baby. Now, if you killed her, it would be like a double murder, but you're getting the death penalty anyway, so it wouldn't look back. But if you killed an a unborn child, they considered it equal to killing somebody else. You'd still get the death penalty for that. Other cultures, they, they didn't care about that. They would say, if you murdered an unborn child, you just kind of paid a fine. You got away with it. And, and so they didn't really care about it that as, as much in other cultures. So the Old Testament law values life. God's always valuing life uh, in their culture. Old Testament law, human and child sacrifice is forbidden. God doesn't says you can't go out and have you know make a sacrifice of your child or make a human sacrifice. To please me, I don't want that. That's bad. You know, you go and you you go and kill a specific animal that was given, but you don't kill humans. That's rare in the ancient world. All kinds of cultures had human sacrifice. They had child sacrifice. They had baby sacrifice. Uh, one of the the saddest stories in the Old Testament. Uh, one of the kings, he is bought into idolatry, and he go. He's the king. He takes the prince and sacrifices him as a baby, and God gets visibly upset obviously because he just committed a sacrifice uh, and that's one of the, the worst sins that you could commit in the ancient world they would go no 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 sacrifices you know if you can kill an animal and please a, and please the gods why not kill a human why not kill your enemy why don't you make him a sacrifice so they would do sacrifices uh, all the time uh, human sacrifices <laughs> God doesn't want that. He blocks that in the Old Testament law. The Old Testament, this is another important one. The Old Testament law did not allow for the condemnation of an entire family for the sins of the father. Now, there is one exception in the Old Testament. Achan, if you remember the story of Achan and the sin at I in the book of Joshua, his whole family is killed, but that was a specific situation. They were under what's called a death pact. And that's a specific way. But generally speaking, you if your dad committed a sin, you were not punished for your father's sin. If he committed a murder, you didn't get killed as well. In the ancient world, that did, that did not happen. They would just, if your dad committed a sin, well, if your dad was evil, you're probably evil too. Let's just get rid of all of you. They'd go out and execute entire families and just say, yeah, well, let's just get rid of everybody. Thing is, and so they would go and just wipe out entire families. If a new king takes over from a different line, 
he'd go and wipe out all the family of the old king. Why? He didn't want anybody having any say in uh, creating a new kind of a rival kingdom. That doesn't happen in the Old Testament. David could does has a chance to kill Saul's son, his grandson. He doesn't do that because the Old Testament law said, no, you don't go out and wipe out everyone's family just because their dad was a uh, you know, shorted you ten dollars at the drive-thru or something like that. You don't go and kill everybody's family because of the sins of one person. So then they also have laws about taking care of the poor. The Old Testament law, they condemn taking advantage. You say they they just don't allow for bribery in the law in any way. So they try to, God, it's like God saying, you, everyone has to play on the equal playing field. Now, in our culture, we're like, I mean, we wish that was true. All the rich people get away with everything. All the poor people are always getting arrested and stuff. And in Israel's culture, God establishes a culture where it don't matter how much money you have. If you, if you break the law, you get the same punishment if you're rich, poor, or however. And the other ancient Near East in, in America for today, if... Uh, if you're, if you're poor and you can't afford a bribe, well, sorry. Or if you're poor and you can't afford a good lawyer, well, sorry. You know, you get the slammer and the rich people get away with everything. God establishes certain things in the Old Testament law to kind of downplay this uh, as best as you can. Then they also have this something called gleaning. This is in the story of Ruth, and we'll get to Ruth eventually. But essentially what would happen is... You're a farm, in a farming community, you go out and you farm and you, you cut down all your grain and you carry it in. Now what they were required to do is, they were required, hey, if you miss something, don't go back and do it. Don't, you know, might be like, oh, I, I cut 80% of my field and I missed 20%. Remember, they don't have like machines to do this like we do now. They're doing it all by hand. So you're going to miss some grain and some stuff uh, and the thing. So what God tells them is, no, if you mess it, miss it, don't do that. Let the poor then go in and get their food if they don't have their own field. So what happens in the book of Ruth? Ruth comes and goes, oh, I don't have any food. So she goes to Boaz's house and she is gleaning. She's doing this very thing because they they're destitute. She's a widow or her mother-in-law is a widow. They don't have any money. So she is gleaning and Boaz is allowing them to come and get the leftovers kind of idea uh, and their crops. Now, they still have to work for it. They still have to go and get from the field. So it's not like a, a free handout necessarily, but it's an, it's an opportunity for poor people to still be able to kind of work if they don't have their own field and and do this and survive so it's kind of think of it like the the welfare system of Israel but welfare in the sense that it's a it creates an opportunity for them to eat and survive while still doing some work in their system the other ancient Near Eastern cultures similar to kind of a lot of cultures today they ain't really care. If you're poor, you're just a burden on society and just get rid of you. You don't want anything to do with the poor. If you're poor, that's your fault and you just die and we'll bury you out in the backyard or something and we don't want anything to do with you. They didn't, they didn't have any type of safeguards. They didn't care about the poor. They would, a lot of times, they would enslave the poor to build, build their next coolest building. If the king, if the king needs a new palace, they'd go, okay, get all the poor people that can't pay for anything, turn them into slaves, and they can go build my next palace or my next fort or whatever they need. So Israelites don't allow that. They, they create a, God creates a system in order to help the poor, but also to help them uh, kind of work for it in a, in a sense as well. The Old Testament law provides the rights and privileges for foreigners in the land as well. You know, it doesn't. It, the, the Old Testament law says if a foreigner comes to the land, you can't just jail them and kill them and treat them wrong and, and do all these kinds of stuff. Ancient Near East, that wasn't the case. You come to the land, you come to some. If you're an Israelite and you go to Babylon or something like that, good luck. You would they would have turned you into a slave generally. 
if you were caught out and, and you didn't have that because they were uh, kind of a clannal system. They don't really have borders in the ancient world. So you could accidentally walk into another country. You kind of stick with your side, on your side with your people. They stick on their side. <coughs> but God establishes kind of some rights and privileges. So, for example, there's a guy in the book of Jeremiah named Abin Melech. He's an African uh I was going to say African-American, but that wouldn't make, I don't know, do they call them African-Israeli? I don't know what the term would be called in, the, in, that, uh, in that situation. But he is from Africa, and he works for the king during that time. He's actually the guy that gets Jeremiah out of the pit and helps him, and, and Jeremiah saves him later when the Babylonians take over. But they allowed for foreigners to be a part of their military, be a part of their government you couldn't do that in most ancient cultures it was like if you weren't born in us you were not allowed to do anything and they probably would enslave you if you came in took their land the big one is the elevation of women this is kind of where we finish out for the night uh, this is the one that a lot of the feminists go after if you read any of the feminists they go oh man those that Old Testament law, that is so bad. They didn't let the women do anything and, and, and this kind of stuff. And it just, in their culture, that just was not true. They gave the women more, more rights and privileges than basically any other culture during this time. One thing they did is they protected women prior to marriage. Now, I don't want to get gross in some of these, but they're just tough. Ancient world... If a woman was not married and didn't have a husband to protect you, it was kind of like open season, essentially. It was like, you know, if, she, if her dad doesn't protect her and her husband doesn't protect her, you, you do what you want with her, essentially, in the ancient world. That's why uh, in Genesis you get the story where Dinah gets raped by the guy and that kind of thing, and you have this, these kind of stories because it was commonplace in the ancient world that if you just want a woman, you just take her and worry about the consequences later. Well, in the Old Testament law, if a rape occurs, let me kind of break this down. I wish I had my whiteboard here. I should have got it earlier. But uh, a couple stages happen. If you rape somebody, the man had to pay the bride price to support the woman, the dowry. He's got to pay that even if she doesn't, even if they don't get married. Why? Because she, if she's no longer a virgin, she may never, no, it's kind of like, well, maybe no one will ever want her. So he's got to pay to support her basically the rest of her life by giving her the bride price. If she wants to get married, she is allowed to get married to him, but she doesn't have to. And, her, and she would make that decision, her family would make that decision. So it's kind of like, God is saying, hey, if you want to rape somebody, it is a serious, you, gotta, you better think about this before you do this, because you are, you're going to have to pay for the, you're going to have to, I mean, dowries are really expensive. I mean, think about it. Jacob, in the book of Genesis, works 14 years for two wives. He works seven years for a wife. So it'd be like, you know, you make $30,000 a year, it'd be like, you better be willing to write a $210,000 check if you're going to do this. That's a, a great uh, nuclear deterrent for rape in your culture is you you got to think through this but it also allowed for the woman to make the decision it wasn't just oh if somebody rapes you they get to have you as your husband it's no if somebody rapes you they got to pay your dowry and then you can make the decision if you want to be in that relationship or not adultery was punished equally for men and women if consensual, this is important, we'll get to the other option here in a second. But basically, if you sleep with, if you got, uh, if your wife is sleeping with somebody else's husband and they're both doing it consensually, both of them would be punished. In the Old Testament law, they both got stoned. Uh, and the other ancient, in other ancient Near Eastern cultures, it was, oh, the woman gets killed and the man can do what he wants because it was. Generally, these other things are patriarchal. I'm trying to say that word, patriarchal. I don't know how to say that word, but male-dominated societies. Let's say that, and so they would let the men kind of do whatever they wanted. The Bible says, no, no, no. If it's if they're both doing it, they both get punished. 
So it provides uh, some more protection for the women. This one is kind of strange. I don't want to, this one's a little strange, and, but it is important. Uh, one of the common practices in the ancient world was you would go get married, have the honeymoon, and then divorce your wife, basically, and say, oh, she wasn't a, she wasn't what I thought she was, and then they would take the bride price back. And so the woman would then be destitute. She doesn't have a family. She's kind of gets called the town prostitute or tramp or whatever term you want to use. And this would lead to all kinds of problems. So the, the Old Testament law says if a husband couldn't just go on the honeymoon and then divorce his wife and say, oh, no, I, I, I went on the honeymoon with my wife and she wasn't a virgin. He couldn't just say that. He had to prove it, and she had the right to defend herself, her, fam her and her family. Now, I don't want to get into the details on how they defend yourself in that situation, but they, regardless, they have the, the ability to defend yourself. And if they were right, then the man could not divorce her. So it wasn't like he could just kind of throw her away off the cast of side. Now, she could divorce him. And I'm, I'm, saying, I'm assuming if the husband tried to do that, you probably would get divorced because it's not going to be a happy marriage. But she had the right. He didn't have the right. So it's giving another idea of giving her protection from these types of situations. This one, I'm just going to have to give some highlights on this one. This is a long one. But uh, this one is the idea. Now remember, they're fighting battles and when you captured a country, you didn't just capture the men, you captured the women and the children as well. Well, and a lot of what times what, ha what happened is if you, capture, if you got a 20 soldiers and you go and capture a town of, you know, you kill all the men and the, the women are like, well, you just killed all of our men. We need some husbands now. We need some potential husbands because you just killed all of our guys. So they would kind of make a deal, all right, well, we'll marry some of our wives, our women to you, and it's kind of a back and forth kind of thing. So the Old Testament law establishes you can't, how it would work is, she, if she was married and her husband died in the war, she was allowed to grieve for a month. So they couldn't just kind of go and capture her and get married the next day. She was allowed to grieve because she lost her husband which was very, almost nobody else did that in the ancient Near East. But she could also then get married to an Israelite guy. But if the Israelite guy didn't want her anymore, say they get married for two years or whatever, he couldn't then, if she was a, a Midianite or, or somebody like that, he couldn't <laughs> then go, all right, I'm going to divorce you and I'm going to go sell you into slavery. She, if he divorced her, or they didn't, if she didn't want, if he didn't want her anymore, she then would be free and become a citizen of Israel. So, all these are kind of safeguards to us. They kind of sound weird because we're like, of course they would have all these rights, but in the ancient world they didn't have these types of rights. So this one is another right. So it allowed for a woman to not be sold into slavery and to deal with all these kind of things. All right, a couple more of these. Uh, this one's very important as well. The women were assumed innocent if a husband accused her of adultery without evidence. So you, if you're a husband, you couldn't just say, oh, my wife is sleeping with, I know my wife is sleeping with somebody, stone her. They'd be like, well, do you have any evidence? And they, and they go, oh, no. Well, then she's innocent. Innocent until proven guilty. Now, to us, that sounds, because we live in a culture that, has been established on Judeo-Christian principles and the Constitution, we have a culture that's innocent until proven guilty. Most other cultures, that's not the case. You're guilty until you can prove that you're innocent. It's like a reversal. So in the ancient Hammurabi's code, this is what it states. If a finger has been pointed at a man's wife because of another man, so basically if, if, you, if, a, if a husband says, oh, my wife slept with another man, but she has not been caught lying, so it, it's kind of up in the air. 
So they didn't catch her in the act, but he's just kind of claiming it. She shall leap into the river for the sake of her husband. Now, what does that mean? They have what's called in the ancient world a thing called trial by ordeal. I should have put this in the South PowerPoint as well. Trial by ordeal means they would put you through a punishment, and if you survive, that means you're innocent. If you died, that means you're guilty. So think about Daniel and the he must be innocent. In our culture, you know, if we if Daniel survives the lions, they must not have been hungry that night. Throw him back in the second <laughs> night. They'll eat him eventually. You know, they they put the three friends in the fiery furnace and they don't get burned up. They let him go because they survived the ordeal. You know, that'd be like for us, we'd be like, oh yeah, the we tried to to hang the guy in the rope broke. We'd be like, well, just go get a new rope. <laughs> we'll get take care of this. That's kind of how our culture is established. They do it. So what they're essentially saying is, oh, if she if she is innocent and we throw her in the river, usually tied up and with a thing like a rock or something established to them, and she survives, she's in, then that means that God showed that she was innocent, and if not, that means she's guilty. That is a terrible legal system because what if she can't swim? It doesn't matter if, she can, if she's guilty or innocent or not, and all this kind of stuff. So... These are the, the Old Testament law establishes uh, some uh, things that other places didn't have. Uh, a couple more here, we'll wrap up. This one, uh, I remember I said the first one was if there was a virgin and she gets raped, then she could decide if she wanted to get married with the guy to pay the bride price. This one is if someone is betrothed, engaged, betrothed, uh, or married, is raped then they just they would kill the man. It was a death penalty thing. In the middle of the Assyrian code, around 1500 BC or so, so right around the time that the law was established, listen to this. Rape was answered with more rape. It states, if the man kidnaps and rapes a girl, then the father of the girl that was raped should kidnap, rape, and keep the kidnapper's daughter for revenge. Now that is a terrible judicial system, and, and it, all it does is just in, and it just destroys more and more girls and through this process. So the Bible's like, no, no, we're not going to create a culture like that. We're going to have some more fair ways to do this and to limit this kind of thing. That just creates a culture where a lot of people are getting raped all the time, and, that, and essentially that's what happens even today in some Middle Eastern countries. Finally, the last one, cult prostitution is not allowed in Israel. God says no cult prostitution. Every other culture in the ancient Near East had cult prostitution, pretty much. And the husband could go to the cult prostitute and sleep with her, and the wife had no say on this. It was just like assumed that your husband was probably going to go sleep with the cult prostitute, and you didn't have a say. The, the Old Testament law says, no, you know how to do that. Also, Unfortunately, fathers tended to sell their, if they had an extra daughter that they couldn't get a, find a husband for, oh, we'll just sell her to the temple, and she'll become a cult prostitute whether she wants to or not. And so all of these are kind of ways that the Old Testament law, Old Testament law is superior to all these other places in valuing life, providing innocence until proven guilty, helping the needy, more whites than women than anything in the ancient, anything in its time. Even though it's even better than a lot of our laws today, and we're, you know, 3,000, 3,500 years later. So, you know, sometimes you hear people say, oh, man, that law was terrible. No, you have to understand what what it's talking about, what, it, what was it like comparably to the other cultures uh, in the ancient Near East. So uh, we'll wrap up there for today. And next, uh, next week we'll get into numbers and Deuteronomy and, and get into all that. So uh, let's go ahead and pray. God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that you are a God that values life, that values uh, equality and helping those in need, that, uh, that established even in a cult, even in a day where many of these were not popular or present, established laws to help and, and do that and many of our laws today even in America are, st are based on some of these 
similar types of laws and ideas that we find in the Old Testament as well. Uh, and we thank you for just giving us your perfect law uh, that we can establish and use in our own systems in our own ways. And thank you for that. And we also thank you that you became the ultimate uh, sacrifice so that we don't have to make sacrifices and, and do these kinds of things uh, that you die on the cross for us as the ultimate sacrifice as well. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right.